just to uh, set the top of the uh, National Art Photographic Art Society of Sri Lanka, which is the FIAP liaison office. And uh, these are third session uh, of uh, such webinar series that we are uh, doing uh, with a with a wider audience as well as with uh, with with international expertise being brought into the uh, onto the table. So uh, on behalf of the uh, society, I wish to welcome all of you uh, for an engaging session today, uh, involving none other than our president of PSA, uh, Mr. J. R. Schnelzer. Um, so since we have already taken a lot of time, uh, I don't want to take any more of your time. Uh, so uh, what I will do is uh, I will hand over to J. R. As you have already gone through the uh, topic. It's about ethics and being ethical and how you conduct yourself ethically in the field of photography. So I think it's uh, becoming very, very important in the current day's context uh, with the different technologies that are coming into play, uh, that we do have a lot of challenges at hand and it's very important for us to possibly understand the repercussions long term as photographers, be it students or be it professionals or teachers, uh, as well as judges and salon chairs, as to uh, why it's important to, uh, you know, uh, keep ourselves up to date with the ethical conduct uh, while practicing our trade. So, JR, with that, over to you. And may I ask all of you to keep your mics muted? We'll take the questions at the end of the uh, session. While you while you want to make any notes and raise any points, you can send it via chat, and I will take it down and raise it at the end of the session. Is that okay with all of you? Yeah? Absolutely. You know, this was right. to. Uh, do you want me to go to share screen? Yes. Yeah. Please. Obviously, one of the things that we wanted to talk about and has been in the forefront of photography since the beginning are the ethics of what photography really is and how we as photographers have to take it upon ourselves to be ethical in what we're, we're showing and what we're doing. Um, I, I don't know what else to say. We've been involved with this since the beginning of photography. Um, you'll note that um, sometimes we represent the world as we see it or are we really representing the world as we see it? Um, this uh, magazine was put together because of, uh, it's a Colorado Outdoors magazine. And there were pictures in there this year that were taken in captivity um, and not in Colorado. And so one of my friends made this fantasy issue showing that you know, if you're really going to represent true Colorado outdoors images of nature, they have to be in Colorado and in the wild. So it's kind of a fun thing that was done. If you look back uh, a long time ago at the beginning of photography, these um, images were spirit photographs and people actually believed that these were the spirits of dead people and that photography could capture them. We know today that this is silly, it's a double exposure, but back then when photography was young and, and introduced, people flocked to have these images made. Um, they really believed that this was spirit photography. And, you know, is that truth? No, it's not the truth of photography. Even back in the late 1860s and 70s, people were manipulating photographs to represent something that really wasn't there. And today we know that not to be true. There's some more of them. These were actual, I mean, some of them were really well put together. The one on the left, really, the, the look on this person's face as this spirit came into his life is, is amazing. And then in the, around 1920, uh, Elsie Wright in England decided uh, that she could photograph fairies and that she and her uh, friend photographed these fairies. And for years, people thought these were true images of fairies. And uh, again, it was a manipulation that was, that it was a hoax mm -hmm. on, on the entire community of photographers out there. 
Amazing. That brings us that brings us to the digital world. And the digital world has changed the way we do things. You know, photography has gone through a lot of evolutions. It started as black and white and went to color. And then color went eventually back to black and white. And then digital came up and we didn't know what to do with digital. And I can remember very well when this uh, book came out by Art Wolf. And it was discovered that he had added zebras into this. And there was a, a firestorm of criticism about him adding these in there, even though he labeled himself and this book as digital illustrations. And today, that's still some of the things that we talk about are digital illustrations. This brings us to the Photographic Society of America Worldwide and how do we regulate unethical practices? There are two divisions in PSA, and divisions are areas of specialty. One of them, is, and this is in pictorial now, one of them is color and one of them is monochrome. And technically, technically, anything can go in the digital enhancement area of these images, and they can be accepted in there. There are some exceptions that we'll talk about shortly. There are three reality-based uh, areas, uh, that being photo nature, photo travel, and photojournalism. And in those areas, they are to be truthful in what they represent. And not too long ago, um, these conditions of entries for exhibitions are published and they explain to the maker or the entrant what is allowed and what is not allowed in each of these divisions. Just within the last year, Ethical Review Board has taken on the task of revising and looking at the entrance in each of these categories and how the entrant may or may not meet the criteria. The bottom line for PSA is we have always, always been in the direction that education is the primary way for the betterment of exhibitions. And the ERB has been very active uh, with looking at these. At the spring board meeting, this, the board as a whole determined unanimously that we needed to look at some of these minor offenses that should be dealt with as warnings. And the board has gone back and looked at all the penalties. And one of the main ones that was of concern were the issues with retitling. The board talked about this and they discussed this. And they all came to this exact same conclusion that many, many, many times, if not most of the time, retitling is an error somewhere. It's an error in typing the name. It's an error in keeping records. And one of our board members even made the, the statement that as you go up in your ROPA and you get thousands and thousands of uh, images that it's much more easy to make a mistake. And what we don't want to do is penalize people for mistakes. So at the spring board meeting, the decision was that retitling of any image is going to be a warning first. And after that, if it's continued, then it will be reach uh, the penalty level. Um, the ERB, the uh, Ethics Review Board, is being uh, reconstituted. Um, some people have left and some people have indicated they want to be on it. And so we are in the process of restabilizing the ERB. And this may take a little bit of time, but we will get there. Um, this is what we did at the um, spring board meeting about retitling. And we have gone back through all the penalties and we have removed those individuals who have been penalized for retitling and only retitling. There are some people who are on the penalties list who had retitling, but they also had other issues associated with their images. So they are still on that list. We don't really want to stifle creativity and the creativity part of it can be uh, manifest in our uh, pictorial divisions, which are open color and open nature. We have an, an exhibition uh, entrance agreement 
And I think when you enter an exhibition, it is your responsibility as the entrant to understand the rules and the regulations that are put upon each of us for every division or section of it. And then you sign off on this, and that meaning that you read this and you understand that. And uh, I know there are times people just gloss over this and they just ignore it. They say, ah, okay. So I think that's where we are with that. Here's a good example. I'm using my own images. This image is not a nature image. It may look like a nature image, but it is actually a composite of two images. I will never and have never entered this in nature. But if I had entered this in a nature competition, I, I've had a lot of people say, why don't you enter that in nature? I mean, it's, it's a perfect example of a nature image, two wolves fighting in the snow in, in a snow covered forest. Well, the problem is this is a two image composite and I am ethical enough not to enter that in nature where someone else may say, oh, this, this will get me a gold medal. I can win with this. You have to be ethical when you're doing these things. And this is just an example from me about what we're doing about ethical behavior. Photo travel, again, photo travel has specific guidelines. And those guidelines, one of which says they can't be a setup. Now I know, and I've had these conversations with FIOP that they allow setups in their only exhibitions because they represent uh, a cultural uh, uh, phenomenon. These were taken, both of these were taken at the recent um, event in India, and both of these were set up for us to photograph. They could be considered photo travel, but I will never enter these in photo travel because they are set up images. They were created for the photographer. And um, it's just the ethical behavior for all of us to do that. Here's two more very famous images. You'll see these, uh, this is in China. And both of these have been set up and made uh, an area for photographers. There'll be about 20, 30 people standing here photographing the scene. Yet these are both setups and they can be used in monochrome, but they cannot be used in photo travel or any other uh, reality-based um, photo. Let's talk about sky replacement in non-reality divisions. You are allowed to replace the skies in the pictorial divisions, but you cannot replace skies in the reality divisions. And I have been seeing and I know that the uh, Ethics Review Board has been seeing, there are people who are replacing skies in the reality divisions, whether it be a nature or whether it be photo travel or even photojournalism. And you cannot do that. You can do certain things, um, increase contrast, saturation, those kinds of things in the reality-based divisions, but you cannot replace the sky. Now, in the um, non-reality in the pictorial divisions, you are allowed to replace the skies. And in this case, that is one of my skies. Um, I have probably a thousand or more skies that I've shot over the years. And I've put that into Photoshop and I can use those. I've taken out the Photoshop skies. But the problem that is facing us is that more and more companies are producing skies and giving you skies to use. It's not just Photoshop. And I, I get ads all the time on internet that said, buy, here's 500 skies you can use for your background. Well, that's an ethical decision that you need to make. If I want this to be truly my image, I can composite it with my own sky. And that is exactly what I've done here. And you as a photographer need to be as ethical as that. Here are three images Two of these have artificial skies and one's a real sky. And the real sky is the upper right-hand side. This is a straight shot of the Zirkel Wilderness outside of Steamboat Springs, the last light striking the mountains in the background. The other two images uh, are skies that I have owned that are my own skies that I've placed into these. So I could use the image in the upper right-hand corner for nature, 
probably wouldn't do very well, but it is a true straight single shot. I enhanced it just a slight by increasing the contrast and, and vibrance, but the other two cannot be used in any of the reality division uh, um, exhibitions. What about star trails? Well, that is and can be a continuation of what you're allowed to do. But if you'll notice, the two circular star trails have different trees in them because I've added them. These cannot be used in any reality division. The one at the top, a scene in a steamboat, or excuse me, in Santa Fe, uh, has the Milky Way added to it. And again, these are great for uh, pictorial because they're my images. Everything in that image is my own and I can use them in pictorial. I could convert them to black and white and I could use them there, but you cannot do that in the reality divisions. Textures have long been um, a discussion item and uh, John Andrew Hughes has been kind enough to formulate several teams to talk about what should be and should not be allowed. And I think that the underlying portion of this or the part that's come to fruition is if you use your own textures, it's not a problem in the pictorial division. Again, these cannot be used in reality because you have added something to it. Remember, in reality division images, you cannot add or remove items. That brings up a question that, that is sort of, um, I'm going to just throw this out for discussion if you want to think about this. If you are taking a picture of a beautiful scenic and there's a piece of white trash in the foreground, you remove it before you take the image, then that's allowed. But if you take the image and remove it electronically or digitally, it's not allowed. So that's an ethical decision that people are gonna to have to think about. What can you and can you not do? So back to the texture images. There's a lot of people who like to put a texture on something. And I think that the bottom line that's come back from the group who has been looking at this is that you can use textures as long as the underlying image is the dominant part of the image and it's yours to begin with. Here's some examples of that. That brings us <laughs> to a whole new issue that's popped up in the last six to nine months. And that is artificial intelligence. A group has been working on this again under the leadership and, uh, of John Andrew Hughes who's the executive vice president, and he's done a great job on working on this. Um, what does this mean for the future? Um, we have unleashed something brand new that can result in some amazing images that I'm gonna show you here shortly. Um, but I think that again, this all comes down to each of our own ethical responsibilities to photography. I met with uh, Ricardo Busi of uh, FIOP, and on several occasions, we've talked about what AI is and what it's going to be doing for the future and where our organizations want to be with this. Um, there are pieces of software that are labeled AI. Uh, the um, Topaz software in particular has gigapixel AI, um, denoise AI. And those are pieces of software that use AI to some extent to help your existing image look better. The problem is that now you can do keystrokes or word and produce photographs technically um, via totally by AI and it has not been a capture. Well, I think Ricardo and I personally both agree that an image that is created entirely by keystrokes or entirely by voice activation is not an, it is not a photograph. A photograph in the terms of what photography is, photo meaning light and graphic meaning image means that it was originally captured via some sort of light capturing technique. And today, most of those are done via 
uh, uh, chips in your camera, uh, light sensitive materials, or in the old days, it was on film. And that is what brings us to the real problem. At this point, and I know this is a moving target and it will probably be talked about in a long sense of the word for the future of what and how this is going to happen. Um, the reality of this is how do you determine what is or is not um, an AI image? I think many of you are aware of this Sony World Award in this year, that this image got first place but the photographer, the gentleman who entered it, did not receive, he refused the award because this was a totally generated and not a photographic capture. So the question came up and we've looked into this and one was, well, have them produce the raw file. That cannot happen because you can generate a raw file from a fully AI generated image. Um, what about the metadata? Well, you can, you can manipulate the metadata the same way. My recent reading, I was reading in the Wall Street Journal the other day that there is an ethical team who are working with these software developers so that these types of images can be identified as fully AI generated and not coming from a complete um, photographic capture. So hopefully in the future, stay tuned, many of these things may be resolved. In the interim, we're having a difficulty with that. But back to our discussion with FIOP and where we are headed. Um, I think we've pretty much said that images that start as a light capture and you utilize AI types of software to enhance that image, then it is your image. But if you take an image, or excuse me, if you take and totally generate an AI or a photograph, technically an image that you call a photograph from AI, that that is no longer and shall not be allowed. And there will be strict penalties if those have been revealed. So again, this totally comes back to the individual photographer and their ethics, where I applaud this particular photographer because I think he was pushing the envelope and then wanted to say, okay, you awarded this and it's not a photograph and I'm not accepting the image. Here in, in uh, Colorado at the Colorado State Fair, we had another image that won first place and it was a generated totally from um, um, voice activated images. And he also refused to uh, take the award. Here are some images that I generated strictly by words. There's, this was not a light capture. It did not start as my image. And uh, I completely generated these by using words. Here's another example. Uh, the image on the left is mine that I shot in um, Las Vegas. And then I went to a piece of software and said, change the cars. And, and uh, you can see, it's the same image, but different cars, obviously not my cars. So I did not add those. Here's an image I shot at the photo gathering in India. And if you're wondering what that is, along the wall, there was some glass put into it to keep people from climbing over the wall. The sun was setting and I shot close up. And then I said, put this through uh, different kinds of uh, AI software. And remember what this originally was, and this is what came up from it. All generated from software. None of this is my image, even though it started as my image, these are not my images. There's another example. I was lucky enough to, to shoot um, um, some studio work. Um, with a few of the, my Indian friends in, in uh, Kolkata. So I took this image and I said, run this through and see what you can make out of this in AI. So remember what the original was, and this is what it came up with. Those are not my images. So that brings us to this discussion and uh, concept of what is ethical behavior for a photographer and where and how are the lines drawn. So I'm happy 
to have this discussion with anyone who would like to. And uh, Beacom, if you want to open that up, uh, let's have some, because this is this is a discussion item. These are evolving, they're changing, and sometimes they're impossible to de determine. So it comes back to ethics and how we as photographers perceive our own ethical behavior. You're muted, Beacom. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes, I think the floor is now open for any questions that uh, the group may have. Uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's, a very, it's a very interesting subject. It's a very interesting topic, very, very relevant in the current uh, day of things when it comes to photography. Uh, if there are any questions that you would want to raise, I just want to go through the chat to see whether there's any comments that have been made up and maybe, okay, there's a suggestion from Mike. Uh, saying open up a separate AI category where people identify images as AI and allow them to explore the technology. Yeah, any comment on that, Jeff? Well, I think we all want to find out what this AI is all about and how we use it. It's evolving, and I know that two or three years from now, it's going to have a whole different way of dealing with things. And I think we as photographers want to explore that, but keep in mind that there is a very hard line between what we start with as a light capture and what we start with as keystrokes or words that are not light capture. So as we move forward and have fun with this, because it is fun, uh, I, I know several of you on there have played with your own faces and played and made yourself into all kinds of things. It's fun, but keep in mind, what is a photography and what is not photography? And here's another interesting point that Bill is making, which uh, where he says, Adobe Generative Fill is a game changer. What are your thoughts on that? Um, it can be, um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I've worked with futurists over the years in different areas of my career. And now we try to sit back and say, what is photography going to be like in 20 years? And who knows what that's going to be like? I remember um, Ansel Adams, uh, of course, donated all of his archives to the University of Arizona with the intent that as technology changes, Photographers could use his uh, archives and make different things from them. He was one that looked ahead. Of course, he passed away before digital became uh, a, a thing, but he looked ahead enough to know that there was going to be an evolution in photography, and we are going to do that. I am hopeful. This is what I, I hope for. I am looking for a card slot somewhere in my ear so I can download all the images that I missed that I saw and never got a chance to capture. And I could download those and plug them into my computer from my mind. Uh, but who knows what the future is going to bring? And, you know, embracing technology is great. Uh, look, I think many of you recall when we were transitioning from uh, film to digital, there were so many people who just refused to do it. It was never going to happen. No, 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 no. I had a very good friend that said, I will never do digital. This is never going to happen. And yet uh, today they have a digital camera. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Stephen. Uh, JR, a uh, question here, JR. Uh, videography is becoming high resolution. We have to be mindful also about having images from screen grab from videos. Do we allow these? Well, now we're talking a very ethical area and it's called plagiarism. We have, PSA has no room in its area for plagiarism. And if you take a screen grab from someone else's images and you can use it, you have violated one of the most ethical rules there is. Uh, and that's called plagiarism. It is not acceptable to use or represent an image that you have not taken or you have not captured and pass it off as your own. So the answer to that is no, but you're correct. Today with the technology, you can make, take a screen capture and make a nice print out of it. Uh, you know, it's pretty unethical to do that. Um, but again, it comes back to your own ethical behavior and how you feel 
ethics involves in your life. And he also goes on to make a, make a statement uh, saying, if we allow smartphone images for salons, having AI as part of its uh, as part of it is something we cannot avoid, which I think is a very uh, straightforward uh, you know statement. If I heard that correctly, and correct me if I'm misinterpreting this, that we should formulate an AI division. Is that what I'm hearing? I believe that is uh, linked to, uh, the, that's one, one end of it. The other is that uh, today the smartphones typically have a lot of AI uh, built into the system. So if you're allowing uh, mobile images, mobile captures in salons, then obviously by default, we are bringing in AI in some form or the other as it is. This is true. Okay, so there's there's two parts to this and let me try to answer each. Let's start first with should we have a AI division within PSA or FIOP? And I believe that in our discussions with FIOP, that is not gonna happen because true AI, which is captured strictly by keystrokes or by words is not a photograph because photograph, again, means that it's captured by a light sensitive mechanism. So we will probably, at least for the foreseeable future, not have an AI division. Who knows what the future will bring? Then speaking of smartphones or phones that are capable of changing the image, again, you are capturing many of the, it doesn't even have to be a smartphone. Many of the new cameras out there have the ability to make changes of that image within the camera capture. And, but you did capture it via a light system. So it's a fine line and it's going to be challenged. And I would suggest you stay tuned or get involved with PSA or FIOP or FIP or any of your organizations if you have a strong feeling about how this is going to go in the future. Because obviously it's evolving and it's changing, and we need to be on the forefront of how we and what we allow to be acceptable. Okay, uh, Judy says, uh, uh, it's a question. Uh, how can I, as a reviewer of PJ, that's photojournalism images, flag unethical images? Is there okay. a procedure? Um, yes and no. Um, it is a very, I do some judging around the world also, and it's very difficult at times to identify some of these issues. Um, a well-trained eye can help. Some things are just obvious. I know um, we had an image that was put into image of the month or something like that. And I had this discussion with another PSA member and it was pretty obvious it was totally AI. And yet we had to leave it because we didn't have any criteria to, to, to remove it from. But there are times when you're looking at something, look at the way the light strikes the clouds and how it strikes the ground. If it's a replacement of a sky. Um, today, it's a really good Photoshopper can make it look almost identical, just like the wolves I showed you. To the common eye, people would say, oh, that's a great nature shot. But again, it comes down to the photographer. We as judges do our best. We try to understand and look at it and say, you know, this just doesn't look right. And then you can ask for a raw file or something. But uh, it's a difficult thing for judges at this time because of the evolution of the technology. Okay, so there's one little comparison that I would like to make in all of this, and that is, this is, AI is such a different medium that we're going, it's going to take us a long time to figure out how and where it's going to be placed in the world, let alone within our organization or any other photographic organization. And so my comparison is, if back a few years ago when I was doing uh, paintings on canvas, if I proposed that I was going to and had every right to put one of those into a print competition with PSA, what would the answer have been? No, because it's such a different medium that it doesn't fit in the photographic genre. 
just as just the same as AI doesn't fit in the genre that we're working with right now. Digital came along. I was one of the people who said, no, I'm never going there. Here I am. At some point, there may be uh, a world transition that we can't avoid. Being part of, of, of aiding the, the uh, transition so that we can all accept it and it has a place to fit into our society is what we're trying to figure out. Is that right, Jair? I think you've said it very well, Vicki. Uh, we are on the cusp of moving forward with this technology. And uh, we have tried to form some teams of people to look at this. If any of you have an interest in that, just let me know. We'll get you on that team. Um, we are trying to wade through all the technology that's you know, being thrown up in front of us. Um, and like I said, who knows what the future is going to bring and where we're headed with that. Um, but we're going to have to be on the forefront of this and deal with it and not let it sweep over us and, and take control of us. We need to be in charge of it. So that's what we're trying to do right now. So thank you, Vicki. Thank you. Okay, there is a, a comment, I believe, being made by Rajdeep, which I was starting off earlier. Yeah, Rajdeep is saying, uh, is there any probability that only raw file format is accepted as unedited file for any submitted image? Anyone can embed except data in a JPEG file and even remove editing software details? Um, I'm not sure exactly what that question means. Um, I don't think with the way we are today, you know, in the old days when we had slides, that slide was what came out of the camera and you, you could make duplicates of it and send them off for exhibitions. And that was the, basically that was a raw file at that point. Today, people taking raw files, and we know that a raw file is all the data that's gathered. It may not be the best example of what you saw in front of you, so we manipulate it and work with it, trying to represent what our eye saw or what our mind saw when we took the image. So I don't see where uh, the raw file would be the only image that would be submitted. As I said, in discussions with some uh, technical people, uh, a raw file can be generated from a totally AI generated image. So that also eliminates that, that question, maybe to some extent. I don't have all the answers, but I have lots of questions. I think Bill Buchanan had a question. If you want to unmute Bill. Yeah, Bill yeah, has asked, uh, has a pictorial or reality section been considered? The key is captured photographically or digitally? The reality divisions are open for photographically captured images, um, but they can't be totally digitally created. I guess maybe that's the answer, Bill. Go ahead, Bill. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I've been working with Greater Detroit Camera Club Council on, on updating their rules. And uh, we thought we were close to uh, having something buttoned up and then Adobe unleashed generative fill. And uh, I don't know how many people have watched uh, Scott Kelby and some of the demonstrations he had with uh, a, a scene in Venice where uh, through keystrokes, he was changing a stairway and the scene with, you know, I mean, it just blew me away. The, the thought that I had, uh, is yes, I think there's a place for creativity and uh, AI and all that stuff. A pictorial division. I mean, you know, I've been a member of PSA for almost 50 years now, and uh, camera cl I, I was camera club for 50 years. And you know, I grew up in a dark room, and and you know, we did certain things, but. I always look towards the pictorial side of photography. Uh, and you know, we talk about the reality divisions such as TJ, uh, photo travel and, and nature. Uh, within PID, uh, could there be flexibility in creating what I would call the pictorial part 
of, of PID, which would be uh, a relatively straight image. Uh, I, I know it'd be hard to police because there are some tools to, you know, the cloning tool to remove that piece of paper and things like that. Worth, worth discussion. Yeah, I think that's a worthy discussion. Um, I think that people who take their images uh, in their cameras and they don't do much with them and they enter them, um, majority of the time they don't do well against those images that have had some um, creative changes to that image. And I'm talking pictorial at this point. So is the possibility there? Absolutely. Um, we as organizations, and I'm speaking all photographic organizations, are, I think, open to reinterpreting what we want to do with our organization and how we view the world of photography. So yes, Bill, I think that's worthy of a discussion. And I know when you're trying to formulate rules and regulations for, for instance, the Detroit Camera Club, it, it's a tough area because some of them are gray, gray areas. And it's the same thing with our ethics review board. There's got to be some gray areas in there and not just pure black and pure white. Thank you. There is a, another question, uh, Jar. Is new uh, AI committee going to educate judges about AI generated images? I think that question is coming from Pandula. Is well, we, <laughs> uh, we are hoping that we can formulate some sort of uh, criteria by which judges can understand what uh, AI is. We, do, we don't have anything cur currently under development, but I know that we're going to need to do that. The issue, and many of you know this, uh, there's been some direction with not only um, PSA, but also with FIOP in developing a, a judge's register that would you know, be available for exhibitions to utilize, to choose judges from. Um, that is under development, but it is not ready to put out there yet because there's still a lot of questions and criteria that have to be developed to make that happen. And um, I think we all, I know in my judging career, I have seen judges that are excellent and I've seen judges that are poor. And so uh, we're trying to develop a process where judges are well-trained and they understand the rules, regulations, and obviously um, being able to identify uh, AI images versus uh, light generated images is part of that. Yeah, I think uh, there is a comment that has been made. Uh, yeah, Brian has mentioned uh, FIAP has a traditional category which would fit Bill's point. I think this is related to the previous question that Bill raised and his explanation on that. FIAP does have this category of traditional photography which uh, means you can't really manipulate anything too much. I don't actually think many exhibitions have offered it, but that any exhibition that wishes can actually lay down, and so can any club say, let's lay down, we want this to be a traditional photograph. Uh, whether you can actually enforce it is another matter. Can I just add something uh, that JR said right at the beginning, which is very important? And that is the PSA is about education. Um, and one of the things we're going to try to do is to encourage exhibitions to be part of this ex education process. So for instance, there are some exhibitions that look through all the images that come in. If they feel an image is suspect, they contact that entrance and say, look, you're, the judges may not like this. You have the opportunity to change it. I'm going to try to encourage as many exhibitions as possible to put that in, to, put, to have that. I am suggesting that they do not judge immediately on the closing date, but allow themselves five or six days to go through all the images and contact any entrance saying, this may not, this may not be ethical. Think about it. Um, and that may cut down the number of uh, if you like, ethics review, ethics thing. Uh, 
We're also thinking of introducing two disqualification for things that are clear breaches. But if it's just carelessness, we just won't call it disqualification. We call it something like non-compliant. You won't get an acceptance because you haven't complied with the rules, but we're not going to punish you for it. If I put a mono picture in for a color image, color section, I don't want to be penalized for that. I just want to just want to be, I just want to be told that I've made a mistake. And that's the approach we've got to take. As JR is absolutely right, we're in the education business. And that's what I would like to keep doing. Okay, there's another question. Uh, I believe this has been already addressed through your presentation, JR, uh, but uh, maybe he was not there at the time. Will photography be replaced by AI? And then what are the ethical implications of AI-generated art? Maybe you could also, uh, you know, touch base again on that in a, in a, in a detailed manner, if I may. Uh, let me do my search for the future. I don't have my Ouija board with me um, and I don't have my globe, but, you know, as I said, we don't know what photography is going to look like in 20 years or 30 or 40 years from now. And um, I can only go by past experience. Um, when black and white was the only form of photography and color came in, oh my gosh, the world was upset that we now had color. And then we went into uh, the phase of uh, digital. Oh my gosh, digital's never going to survive. It's film's just too important. And look what's happened today. I have a freezer full of film out there that uh, will probably never get exposed. So what's the future going to look like? You know, I think AI is becoming more and more important. But my best guess, and, and it's a guess, is that there's going to be something that takes the place of AI in the future. What that is, like I said, maybe we'll download the memories from our brain somehow. Uh, who knows what we're going to be facing in the future? So. I think we, meaning us as photographers, and I'm not speaking about PSA, but just us as photographers, need to be open to concepts, need to be open to technology, need to embrace things that we think are important and help us become better photographers and discard those things that either are unethical for us or really don't enhance the way we see the world. Yeah, to add to, add to that, uh, Jair, uh, there's a comment that has been made by uh, Mr. Bandagun Ratna. I think his, re his reference is to uh, the use of remote controlled uh, vehicles or toy vehicles to photograph animals and birds from you know ground level point of view. And uh, that he suggests that, you know, obviously those such kind of uh, photographs need to be vetted out of the system uh, by the judges especially in the nature division. Well, okay, so let's talk a little bit about nature and um, this concept of having disturbed nature. A few years back, drones became very, very popular. And uh, we had a rule that if it disturbed uh, people or disturbed nature, that they shouldn't be allowed. And that's been changed because I can remember many images flying over with a drone over a herd of buffalo and then they start running because they've been disturbed by the, the, um, the drone. So we've gone through that phase a little bit. Um, there was also a, a unique television series and I forget, it was about maybe a year or two ago where these photographers made animals that look like the animals they were in, put a camera in and they go in and try to socialize. And it was a, a full blown TV show about this. And it was very interesting. But again, did it disrupt the animals? Did it bother the animals? We have a rule very succinctly that there should not be anything in nature that disturbs or um, for instance, you, you can't throw live mice out for the uh, snowy owls to capture. Um, it's not allowed. Um, so again, 
this still comes down to what this whole program is about is the ethics of the photographer. And if there's a way, uh, because yes, I, I know there's people who put cameras on motorized vehicles, but they also have um, camera traps, which are attached to a tree and an animal goes through and it captures an image. Did that disturb the animal? Probably not. So how and when you're going to be able to identify these is very, very difficult. Um, I would be hard pressed to be able to determine just because it was shot at a low angle that it was shot from a remote robot, robotic uh, vehicle. So I think it's gonna be very difficult to do that. Uh, it, it comes down to the individual photographer's ethics. And if we find a photographer who is very unethical in how they represent the world and how they represent their images, those are the ones we want to penalize and make sure that they aren't allowed to continue uh, with exhibitions. And I think that's what we're trying to do. It's difficult. There's a lot of gray areas here uh, and uh, it's, it's just going to be difficult. And as technology advances, it's going to become more difficult, I believe. Uh, Judy, do yeah, you have I, any? I, my question, I think, is there's been a lot of discussion on it. Uh, and because I feel that the responsibility is always put on to the person providing the image. Recently, I have been involved in reviewing uh, the photojournalism images on the gallery. So that is one vehicle the PSA has to look to look to identify images. But and so the wording under the in, in the section on galleries is that exhibitions will be notified only if there's serious breaches. So will all of these regulation or these policies then have to be changed? And what is the responsibility of me as a review uh, as a reviewer in identifying these things? If I bring things to the attention of people with with uh, positions of uh, authority to follow up, what happens if they aren't followed up? I'm just looking at this as a, the, uh, as a point of view of a reviewer. A reviewer. Well, thanks, Judy. Um, like I said, we are re-establishing um, the Ethics Review Board. It'll take a little bit of time. We're trying to find uh, people who would like to serve on that. And we do the best we can. The reviewers and the investigators that we've had are unbelievable. They, they have done an outstanding job in being able to identify many of the issues. Do they capture all of the problems? Probably not. You as a reviewer, I think your responsibility is to use your best ability to identify something and pass it along. And that's where that ends. It's, it's not for you to do a heavy investigation, but if, you're, if you find something that you just doesn't seem right or look right, you pass that along. And our investigation teams that, were, were, that are here and that are reforming, I think will take these on and try to find that for you. So. Your responsibility is just to do the best you can in identifying something that just doesn't fit with the uh, criteria. One of the previous comments and questions that we had from Stephen, uh, he's referring to videography uh, done by the videographer himself and a screen, a screen grab that he takes, he or she takes and produces a, at a salon. Is that allowed? That's a little different than the way I interpreted the question earlier. Um, today, here, here's a problem that we need to resolve um, because I have seen this in competitions. Cameras today can capture between five and 50 frames a second. And let's say you're taking a photo of a bird taking off in flight, which could be video. And technically, when you get 24 frames a second or greater, it, it's considered video. But I have seen, and just recently, I saw some images that were shot of the same bird taking off. And, you know, a split second, it was maybe a hundredth of a second later. It's a little further, a little further, a little further. And they're all in the same competition. One of the things that um, the board would like to see is that images taken that are similar, taken at the same time, cannot be in the same exhibition um, or the same category 
And that's a problem. But technically, you can take a, a screen grab of your video. You can take one frame out of your 20 frames and you can enter it. You just can't enter five frames or excuse me, four frames in a row of the same image of the same subject in um, the same exhibition. I don't know why people do that, but they do. And then they get awards and it's it's crazy. It is in the conditions of entry, but similar pictures uh, may not be entered. It's a question of for the exhibitions to monitor that, but it's a very clear statement in the conditions of entry that that, that, that sort of image is not permitted. Yeah, and that's where the committee chair and the, and the exhibition chair need to, you know, remove those when they're submitted. I mean, once they're submitted and you look at them and you got four of the same subject, same location, split seconds apart, they can't be entered. So that's why I want exhibitions to take time over uh, looking at the images before the judging starts. So a judge shouldn't be faced with that because the, the, the exhibition chairs are part of our education process and they should say these are not acceptable and say back to the ancient, don't do this replace some of the images. So we've got to stress this, that ex people that run exhibitions are not doing it for money. They're doing it because they're part of our education process. And therefore we, we've got to lean, uh, educate chairs that they're part of the education process. Then we're all working together. And that is true, but I think it really starts with the photographer. The ethics of that photographer, he should be aware or she should be aware that you can't do that. Don't be take those images, take the second one and put it in a different exhibition, take the third one, put it in a different exhibition. It starts with the photographer and the ethics of that photographer, and then it falls on the chair of the exhibition, as Brian said. Agreed, agreed. There is a question that came from Susan. Could you uh, could you explain the question, Susan? Because uh, what you have written down is a question I have gotten from people. Well, I have used 2010 file and then 2012 and 14. Why isn't that okay? What they might have entered is uh, well, the rest of it is not very clear. Susan, are you you there? One of the yeah. issues that uh, we're talking about similar images. Um, is that there are group shoots and I've seen them by different photographers and that wouldn't be necessarily an ethical issue by the photographer. But um, in this case, that's where the chair should identify, okay, these are all similar images, but by different makers. And that, that's allowed. But when I'm judging and I see similar images, I don't know the maker's name. So I have to ask the chair to look at that and say, is this by the same maker as that image? And so when it gets down to judging, as Brian was ex explaining, it starts with the photographer and the ethics of that. It goes on to the chair to maybe eliminate them before they even get to be judging. But as a judge, or as you're looking at them, if you see similar images, you probably should ask the chair to identify. Okay, I think that's Susan. Okay, a lot of people ask me, how different does a image have to be? The problem with in-camera dupes, most people don't understand what they are. Now, you said that they could use like three images that were just a little tiny bit off. And in reality, if they put the same title on, then they can be... Um, sanctioned because they're different images and of course they shouldn't enter them in the same exhibition because then they're competing against themselves and if FIAP is involved FIAP has a rule that says if somebody takes a, a, like if there's a group shoot and two items are entered by different people that only one of those items can be uh, an award. The other one cannot, even if it's a different um, person taking the image. But I don't, I think according to the rules that, um, and what's been happening is they name it the same because it looks almost like, but not quite, 
the original. And if they entered it in different exhibitions, would it be possible? They can't enter the same title because then the uh, ethics review board looks at the um, images and if they can't put them on top of each other, then they say that they've duplicated the title. Okay, Most people so do not understand in camera dupe. Can you explain that, please? I'm, I'm just going to make a comment and then I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Um, yeah. Every capture that you make in your camera has a unique number or associated with it. And each capture, therefore, has to have a unique title. Brian, do you want to take that over? Yeah. Um, it... I don't fully understand what Susan getting at. I have to say, I don't think you do either. Uh, but certainly, uh, the a picture has to have the same title all the time. The problem is that we forget, don't we? Um, and uh, it's something we've got to look at is somehow how identifying things. There are some very good software programs out now. Uh, there's one from the British, and there's one run by. Alexei Anisimov, you have to pay for it. But you record your, when you record, when you keep a record of your images, your uh, entries, you put a picture in so that you, you're never, so you can never be falling into the trap of entering the same picture with a different title because you've got your, on your record, you've got the image there and it shows you, and you, you put in every time you've entered it. Um, what I'm talking to Arnab about, when we get the uh, uh, acceptance database working properly, uh, whether there's some way in which uh, we can deal with that problem. The difficulty is that the poor, the poor people, star ratings directors, can't be expected to, to, to fight, check whether you've entered the same title, the same picture with different titles. It's an almost impossible job for them. So it's something we've really got to think about. Um, I don't know whether we can find a technological answer to it, whether we store everybody's image, but I don't think we can do that. But I say, I mean, we have lots of group. I mean, those of us have judged a few years back. People may remember that there was a lot of robber flies in pictorial images, in nature, in all sorts of things. And the robber flies were winning everything. And what clearly happened was a, a Camera, a group of people went on a robber fly force and we were flooded with pictures of robber flies. And it is very difficult for a judge to be able to differentiate whether this robber fly is done by that author or that robber fly by another one. Okay, there, there is a question here uh, which says uh, two persons shoot the same view in a group shoot and produce to a contest with the same title. Most probably it's a very hypothetical situation that may not arise all the time, but the question is what will happen? Well, I think uh, I've addressed that, and that is that it needs to be identified by the chair um, that those images are the same image or similar image, but they're different authors. And then as a judge, if you see it, because we don't see the names of the authors, that if we see something, we should ask the chair to compare this. You say, I saw this image and this image looks similar. Can you tell me if it's the same person? That's the only way we can uh, uh, deal with that. Um, photo shoots are common, especially with our clubs and our chapters and our organizations. We go out and do the same thing. We did it in um, uh, Chaslamir when we were up there and we were photographing um, many of the models. Many of us have that same image, but they're done by a different author. And it may be a little slightly different angle, but they're very similar in relationship. The husbands and wives taking the same photograph. Um, yeah. You know, I, I've had this where one year I've given an acceptance to a husband's picture, and the next year the same picture turns up, up taken by the wife. Yeah. Uh, and there's no way around, we can get around that. Vikram, can I uh, raise one point to Brian? Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, Brian, uh, you were talking about uh, uh, checking the similar uh, 
names of the, the I mean the titles, but as I uh, uh, RSDs, sorry, uh, as um, star rating directors, uh, normally what we do is if we come across any ve very very similar type of title, uh, we ask from the from the same uh, photograph. So basically, we trust the person. But if it is a completely different uh, title, we can't do anything. Brian, you get my point. Brian, Brian? that was you. Well, uh, yeah, you can't do it if it. Th 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 there's nothing you can do if it's a different. If it's the same picture taken by a different person, but has a different title, you have to allow it, don't you? No, no. Actually, my point is now. Say if there is a similar kind of a. Uh, title, we ask from that uh, person whether this is from the same image. So we basically trust the person. We don't even ask for the photograph. If he says, no, this is from two different photograph, we accept it. But if it is a complete different two titles from the same image, we can't find out. No, you can't. Yeah. That's the thing. It's basically completely on the trust. Comes back to what we're talking about the ethics of the photographer and we want ethical photographers to be in our organizations we want uh, ethical photographers to represent the world in a truthful manner and uh, if they don't then that's where i think our ethics review board steps in and uh, we penalize them for being unethical yeah if we, we don't take the approach that everybody out there taking photographs is a villain, uh, we, we've got to ha we've got to trust each other. Uh, and you know, if, if we if we approach this with a, everyone who's trying to enter a picture is a cheat, we're going to create the wrong atmosphere. So in the in, in essence, we, we 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 rely on our entrance on being ethical when we catch them out, then we must deal with them. But we, we, we mustn't adopt an overly punitive approach. Uh, otherwise, people won't want to take part in PSA activities. They won't want to take part in, in, in exhibitions. So I'll, I'll, I'll let me add on to that. Um, we, we definitely want to eliminate the people who cheat to win. We, yes. we do not want to penalize or appear to be penalizing everybody and their brother because they've made an error and they've done it accidentally or something like that. But the rules are very specific. And I think the goal is number one, to, and to try to force those unethical behaviors as much as we can. We don't want to appear that PSA anyway is strictly here to penalize people and to hunt them down and to shoot them. Um, but when they continue or, or they absolutely cross the line of ethical behavior, they need to be identified. Are we going to get them all? No. But we will certainly put people on notice that we are checking. That's the big deal. So it's good to see you, Pandela. Thanks. Yeah. So, Vikram, are we summed up for the, for the day? I believe so, because I don't see any more questions. Uh, and let me just summarize a couple things. Thank you all. I apologize for all the technical and the, the, the time wasting that we had, but I think this was a very good conversation and it will continue. If you have an interest personally to be involved in future discussions, let someone know. You can let Brian know. You can let me know. Um, and um, we want to continue this conversation. I'm hoping that some of you will, I will get to meet personally in um, Williamsburg for our PSA annual conference and uh, photo festival. And I am looking forward to meeting many of you again on re-establishing friendships next July in Indonesia. But more importantly, in 2025, I want to see all of you in Sri Lanka. Yes, very much. So that's that's great. Uh, so again, uh, I would like to thank on behalf of the uh, association of the society uh, in Pass uh, for all those who attended this session. Uh, we did have technical glitches. Uh, thankfully, uh, uh, it 
we did come through pretty well, I thought, at the end of the day. Uh, we will have a recording of this and that we will share in the future with the people who want to uh, go through it again. And also there are people who have missed out on it uh, from different time zones. Um, Shanta Ayaf, would you like to say a few words uh, of thanks? Actually, yeah. yeah. Actually, I would like to thank uh, JR, Ban and other participants uh, who joined uh, from various parts of the uh, world uh, for this uh, forum. Uh, thanks again, and uh, we'll uh, do uh, this kind of uh, uh, webinars in the future also. So I invite all of you to join in our future programs too. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sankar. Thank Good night. You. Good to see all of my photo friends. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vikram. Thank you, Vicky.